Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have uh, Samuel Ramsey. He's a founder and director of the Ramsey Research Foundation. Uh, He graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Entomology from Cornell University in 2011 and has focused research on predatory and parasitic insect behavior. Saw him, uh, I thought it was a TED Talk, but it's actually wired on YouTube. I saw where he was talking about cicadas and he was really engaging and interesting. So I wanted to have him back and uh, talk about his work. So Sammy, thanks for coming. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Well, tell me if you would, uh, what's, what's the background on the wired story? Like, how did they find you and Why do they want to know about cicadas? And maybe we could talk a little bit about cicadas after that. It's a great question. So uh, I ask people that all the time. I'm always wondering how people stumble across what it is that I'm doing. And they found me through an NPR interview that I did with Shortwave. And that seems to have really gotten, um, that was early on in the whole cicada mania that, that got started. They released that before, well before the cicadas had even come out. And so the excitement around that seems to have snowballed. Okay. Yeah, and I've, I learned a little bit about cicadas. I guess they come out on prime number years. There's mm-hmm. ones that are come out every 11 years and 13 and 17. And is that right? There are cicadas that emerge every 13 years. In every 17 years, uh, we don't have any on the, uh, the whole 11 spectrum, but the periodical, I, I wouldn't be too surprised if we ended up with a periodical brood that emerges every 11 years. They are splitting off and evolving all the time. Like, why, why are you interested in cicadas? How did you get your first, first encounter them and get interested? When I was really young, so maybe seven or eight years old, and I was pretty interested in entomology at that age. Actually, I was pretty obsessed with entomology at that age. I I would find these shells just hanging on trees. It was very clear that there was no organism animating this shell, but that there once was. And I wanted to better understand it. Uh, What I didn't know at the time was that those were annual cicadas, and that just uh, almost a decade later, uh, I would get the opportunity to experience a full-on periodical cicada emergence. I spent some time reading about them and learning about how they go through this metamorphic process where they pop out of their old skin and climb into the trees and are able to serenade other cicadas such that they can find a mate. And I was really enamored with it, but it wasn't until I was in high school that I actually got to see the periodical cicada emergence. So when I was a kid, you'd see a couple of shells here and there on a tree every year, but the periodical cicada emergence is one of those things that you could never possibly miss. Those cicadas make themselves heard. They are incredibly conspicuous. And I loved seeing these insects just kind of take over for a while. 
Yeah, I grew up in New York and I remember the shells on trees. And you know, I remember my dog, like he would take a cicada in its mouth and bring it in. And my mother would scream. You know, they were, they were huge. So you think, oh my God, they're going to hurt you. But they're pretty harmless. Like you can put them on your hand and they buzz and they, they don't really seem to do anything to hurt people, you know? Precisely. They're gentle giants in the insect world. I think one of the problems is that people have the impression that most insects are capable of causing some harm. And you start to have this perspective instilled in you from watching other people's behavior. People scream and fly off the handle if a bug of any sort touches them. And so we kind of get the idea that there are a few insects that can't hurt you, but the vast majority of them are worth our fear and ire. And it turns out it's quite the opposite. There are very, very, very few insects that can actually cause you harm. And the ones that can just happen to to be the most talked about, of course. Yeah, like for some reason, I just, I'm not as repulsed by cicadas, but roaches, I just hate. Do cicadas serve any beneficial purpose? Like what eats them? You know, they're creatures that come out when they do and that eat them and then all of a sudden flourish. Like what are they, what are they for? Well, it turns out that they don't want things uh, to really get them all figured out and turn them into their preferred meal. So cicadas, while they have no method of defending themselves sort of anatomically or chemically, their method of defense is to show up in such huge numbers in such a strange and periodic manner that no creature can develop a taste for them and wait for them to come out the next time. Any creature that decides it's going to sync up its life cycle to cicadas would have to figure out how to go after these organisms. The cicadas, when they emerge from underground, any creature that wanted to sync up with their life cycle would have to only eat once every 17 years. So they've got that whole deal figured out such that when they do emerge, they really don't need to have a a particularly well-refined method of defending themselves. There's nothing out there that could possibly eat all of the cicadas. So the fact that they don't have any defenses means anything can try. Dogs, cats, squirrels, raccoons, birds, even snakes will snack on cicadas. Pretty much anything with a mouth will chew on cicadas. Uh, but they just can't eat enough of them to be able to deal with an emergence like Brood 10 that has trillions of cicadas all emerging in the same short period of just a few weeks. Trillions. Wow. Mm-hmm. So you, you spoke earlier about annual ones. Like, what are their, what's the estimation of their numbers? And they probably do have things that prey on them, right? Yes. So the annual cicadas do have some specialized predators that will go after them. There's a type of wasp called the cicada killer. I actually have a picture of it uh, behind me, but of course you can't see that because this is a podcast. But uh, the cicada killer is a fascinating wasp that goes after cicadas. Uh, It injects its egg into the body of the cicada and paralyzes it and then buries it underground. Uh, And that cicada then becomes an incubator for a developing larva that will consume that cicada turn its biomass into its own body and fly off and do the same thing. So it's able to, of course, sync up to this annual cicada life cycle. But if it's synced up to the 17 year cycle, it would only be able to eat once every 17 years. So these, so the, um, well, what do you call, all right, so you call the annuals, the annuals, what do you Mm -hmm. call these ones that come out every, you know, 13 or 17 years? Those are your periodical cicadas. Their genus Mm -hmm. is called Magicicada because come on, it is a pretty enchanting experience. So what's different about them coming versus, you know, besides their numbers, what effect do they have on their on the ecosystem around them? When periodical cicadas emerge, they emerge in such huge numbers that they're able to feed every, pretty much every predator around them really, really well. So that means that birds are able to lay a lot more eggs than they would otherwise. That means that squirrels can have a larger volume of offspring than they could otherwise. It allows for all of these creatures to have a much more easily available proteinaceous meal that they can consume pretty quickly uh, and pretty easily. Now, the interesting part of that is also that when the cicadas do die, the ones that have made it had the opportunity to mate and lay eggs, their carcasses are going to fall out of the trees, they're going to decompose, and they're going to provide a lot of nutrients back to the environment. And as a result of doing that, those plants can then grow better than they would have been able to otherwise. Huh. Do they interact with bees? Or like what happens to, um, you know, if you have a big farm and you have a cicada year, do the cicadas destroy your crops? Or do you have a bumper year after that because of all the 
protein they left behind and all the other animals that they've helped feed? Great question. Now, cicadas and bees aren't going to have a lot of direct interaction, but the fact that they're providing this much biochemical input into the soil will allow for plants to potentially be able to produce greater biomass in the next season. So you're not going to see it immediately. There's not just going to be this big explosion of, of plant growth as a result of their presence the same year that they emerge. But the next year, you should see uh, a healthier, more lush ecosystem as a result of, of their emergence. The other thing that is fascinating there is there is the possibility that then there will be more flowers. Those flowers will then provide more nectar and more pollen to the bees such that their colonies can be healthier as well. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click on support us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. Ecosystems are entirely interconnected, and it's this web that really makes it the complicated and fascinating system that it is. The other thing that people really do worry about in this context is, what happens to my crops? If I'm a farmer, are these organisms going to emerge and cause damage? I'm sure you've noticed that sometimes people refer to them as locusts, and locusts can be really, mm. really damaging organisms. But they are not locusts. And cicadas do not damage crops. Um, the most problematic impact that they have is that when the females are laying eggs, they choose branches that are about a pencil's width in, in diameter, and they'll lay eggs in that branch, carving notches into it along the way. Those notches can disrupt the vascular structure of the plant such that the plant isn't able to move fluids back and forth through the branches and into the leaves the way that they normally would. And that section of the branch can die back. Now, for a tree, because they already have so many leaves, so many branches, it's probably not going to be that big a deal, at least for a mature tree. Uh, it rarely causes lasting damage of any sort for these larger trees with all of uh, their extra biomass that they have there. But smaller trees are more vulnerable because they don't have all of those branches to spare. And losing a few of them can actually be detrimental to the plant. It can stunt growth or for much smaller plants can even kill them. And so if you happen to be somebody who just planted a bunch of apple trees and they're really young the same year that the cicadas emerge, you may have to put a net over them to keep the female cicadas from laying eggs in the branches. But aside from that, that is the the impact that they have on developing plants. Um, they're not going to go after crops. They're not going to eat your tomatoes. They're not going to eat the corn. Uh, it's just not their thing. They are here for a good time, not a long time. They're going to mate. They're going to lay eggs, but that's kind of it. What do they eat though? So they feed very little over the course of their time above ground, rather than very little, I should say. They feed in a, a rather inconsequential manner in that they're feeding on something called the xylem sap inside of the plant. This is from the vascular structure of the plant. Plants move two different kinds of sap through their body. One is the phloem sap. That's what we eat. That is maple syrup and uh, the, the, the really sweet sap that you see coming out of a tree as a result of some level of damage. And then there is the phloem sap. Now, the sugars are primarily in the, wait, did I just say phloem twice? Xylem sap. The sugars are primarily in the phloem, but the xylem sap is mostly just water. Uh, there are some dissolved nutrients and minerals in there too, uh, but for the most part, it's water. And so as a result, the cicadas are not eating a very nutrient dense meal. They're yeah. not harming the tree very much because there's not much of value that they're sucking out of the tree. Uh, and so their feeding doesn't really cause much in the way of damage and is very difficult to even discern when it's occurring. For a while, we thought that they didn't even feed above ground. So if people attract farmland that's been affected by cicadas, you know, the years leading up to them and then the year that they happen and the years after, and do they see like a, you know, a dramatic change in the farm uh, viability when they come? In my research on the subject so far, I, I have found uh, that there have actually been some 
recordings, they are still anecdotal uh, in a number of ways, but just us recognizing that people throughout history uh, have seen that when the periodical cicadas emerge, the following year, the plants seem to, like the, the, the edge of the forest seems to do a lot better. There seems to be much greater growth at the forest edge. And what we've realized is that cicadas prefer the edge of the forest. And we have created so many forest edges by cutting up uh, sections of forest and splitting them onto two sides of a highway or uh, development in the middle with a mall or something. And then there's a section, just a row of trees behind it. This has created multiple sections of forest edge for these organisms. And each year we've noticed that those areas are each year, each periodical emergence, we've noticed that these forest edges just seem to do better. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. I don't know. Is it, well, it's not frequently enough, unfortunately, but it's too bad it's not every three years because then people could go and you know, they know there's going to be trillions of them. They could <laughs> harvest them and you know use them in all kinds of places for food and for different animals. You know? Precisely. I, I'm glad that you bring that up because cicada protein is really good protein. It's one of the reasons why you probably have noticed during this whole cicada mania situation that we had going on this time around, multiple different places were offering some sort of cicada meal, cicada tacos, cicada stir really? fry, deep fried cicadas. For some time now, they've been referred to as the shrimp of the trees. And if you can, you can probably get an idea for why somebody would go after a cicada. I hear people say all the time, oh, that is disgusting. I would never. Could you hand me some of those crabs though? And, and some lobster and a shrimp. Those are sea bugs. Those are yeah. sea bugs. There is no real difference between your sea bugs, which you eat all the time, and these tree bugs. And so uh, I'm glad to see that people have recognized this and are understanding that our carbon footprint is pretty substantial, primarily because of the huge volume of cattle that we raise in order to eat them. And if we could replace just one of our meals per week with insect protein, which is far more efficient, several times more efficient in uh, the amount of protein that this organism is able to produce and the amount of food that it's able to consume. And so we could put a pretty substantial dent in our carbon footprint if we were willing to snack on creatures like cicadas more. So have you eaten, have you tasted this uh, latest group of cicadas? I have. There's actually a chef, Chef Joseph Yoon, who uh, came down and made a, an eight-course cicada meal for me and a few friends, for several other entomologists. And he's just been trying to get the word out about this too, about how important insect protein is. And so uh, it was really interesting to see just how well creatures like this can be prepared um, with just some, some, chili, some chili oil and some soy sauce. You can really spice these up into quite a meal. But do they taste good? Yeah, shockingly. Uh, the, huh. the, it's the exoskeleton that you would expect would be a problem because it's pretty crunchy and people don't like to have that that whole crunch crunchy deal going on. But if you catch the cicadas, if you collect them upon emergence, there's a period of time where they are emerging from their exoskeleton. And it's the same general concept of a soft-shelled crab. If you've ever had a soft-shelled crab before, that's a crab that just emerged from its exoskeleton. And as a result, it's no longer crunchy like you expect from that, that hard armor that they have on them. The cicadas are like that too. And if you cook those cicadas, you don't even have the crunch as a deterrent in this process. And so it actually, it is a system that makes a lot more sense than I would have, uh, than a lot of people would have originally attributed to it. What did it taste like? Does it taste like chicken or like, did it have a weird flavor? You know, there is, it is very hard to describe the flavor of a cicada. There is a, I expected it to be more like seafood and it really wasn't. Uh, they did not taste like shrimp, but they did have something of a consistency, a bit like seafood, along with sort of a nutty taste to them. I don't know. You think of like okay. walnuts, hazelnuts, mix them all together into something. Interesting. So you mentioned earlier, they're not locusts. What's a locust versus a cicada? A locust is a type of insect that is related to grasshoppers. They have this 
the segment of their life cycle that triggers this gregarious stage where they will all come together in mass and descend on an area and eat every green thing out there. A clear defining feature of them is that they have chewing mouth parts where they can latch onto something and they move these mandibles back and forth and they can chew a plant down to the ground. A cicada is a type of insect called a true bug. Uh, Only insects within this narrow order of true bugs are actual bugs. Everything else that we call a bug is not a bug in the entomological sense, but a bug in the colloquial sense. Now, a defining feature of these true bugs is that they have a straw for a mouth part. Uh, That's the part that they stick into the roots of trees or into the branches of trees such that they can feed on this xylem sap that I was discussing earlier. This separation between the two of them based on their mouth parts is a very clear defining feature that lets you know that they are in two very different orders of insects. The grasshoppers, the crickets, they are part of a group called the orthoptera. And the true bugs, so your bed bugs, your your assassin bugs, your stink bugs, your cicadas are all part of the hemiptera. Interesting. And then the annual cicadas, are they very different from the you know the periodic ones? And why aren't they are they harvested very much? Are they ignored or what's different about them? They are ignored for the most part because their emergence, it just kind of occurs with a whimper. They can be pretty loud, but they just don't emerge in these gigantic swells of insects that come along with chorusing, where a bunch of them are all getting together, making a lot of music together. It's more the case that you'll see a few of them by themselves. They'll show up, they'll climb up a tree, and they'll typically show up in the middle of the night. So most people don't even get the opportunity to see them. What they'll see is the shell that they leave behind, and they're long gone by then. They're in the treetops, Uh, They'll do a bit of singing, and people have heard that and reported to me that the cicadas are still out. I thought you said they would be gone by July. Well, Mm. those are annual cicadas that you're hearing. They also look pretty different. Uh, If you think of the black cicada with the orange wings, you're instead going to see something that's more of a green and black cicada, looks like he's wearing army camo with green wings, and that's your periodical cicada. Have, uh, has anyone been able to figure out how the cicadas know when to come out, you know, after 17 years or 13 years? I really do hope that we get that whole thing figured out soon because mm-hmm. it is just, it has been mysterious for far too long. It is absolutely incredible that these organisms are able to coordinate a mass emergence, not just after 17 years, but even such that they emerge over the same set of weeks. So these organisms, most of the time, the the majority of them will be all out of the ground within a week of each other. And that is incredible. And they can delay this emergence because remember, if a bunch of them all show up a few weeks too early, they can mess this whole system up. The The way that they protect themselves is through predator satiation, such that any creature that tries to eat them could never possibly eat all of them. Well, that doesn't work out if you have some of, some of them emerging the first week of May, some of them emerging the last week of May, some of them emerging the middle of June. Then you've got time for the predators to eat a bunch of them, get full, eat a bunch more, get full, eat a bunch more. You want to overwhelm your predators with your numbers. So somehow these cicadas are able to get across to each other. I know that we were supposed to be emerging on May the 17th. The tree seems to be telling me that there's going to be a weather event there. Uh, It might be a a really heavy rainstorm. It can make it really difficult for us to emerge that week. Let's, uh, let's, Let's move it back a week. And somehow all the cicadas get this message. We think that it's actually from some of the the environmental changes that happen with trees uh, as they're going through their process of growing and developing. So as the, the tree grows and develops each year, there are seasonal changes in the biochemical constructs of the tree such that as the cicada is feeding, it can count. Uh, Because these are cyclical changes that happen every spring, every winter, they can say, all right, this is my first winter, my second winter, my third winter, my fourth winter, all the way up until their 17th. And they know, all right, this is the year. This is the year where I am going to emerge. Now, their ability to actually tell where there's going to be an adverse, uh, an adverse weather event, we think is a result of them being able to sense uh, some of these changes in the trees as well. Uh, But 
at the end of the day, we still don't fully understand how they're able to coordinate all of these matters together. We do know that the cicadas will dig something called a chimney, sort of a, a hollow tube up to the surface where they will stick their heads out and kind of get a feel for the ground temperature and what's going on around them and determine whether it's time for them to emerge or not. Oh, so they're not just passively sitting in the ground and capsules where they don't communicate with each other. Like what, yeah, what are they doing in the ground? Are they hibernating? Are they sleeping? Does anyone try to longitudinally allow us, you know, a bunch of cicadas to burrow into a, a big cube of soil that's monitored? If no one has done that, Someone definitely should. It would be really incredible. So something that I've proposed is that we take a giant glass box. uh, We enclose the roots of a tree uh, in this big glass box. And we monitor the development of these cicadas uh, in this process where we get to watch them. We get to see how much they move on a regular basis. Unfortunately, one, that would take a long time. A long time. That would be crazy quite an undertaking for a study. But in addition to that, there are elements of this process that would require us to change the natural set of circumstances that the cicadas are in so that we can see them, so that we can monitor them, and that may change elements of their behavior. But there's still a lot that a study of that nature could teach us. What we do know from studies that have dug up cicadas, studies that have monitored them in uh, in the ground, we do know that the cicadas are awake. They are not hibernating during that period of time. They're not particularly active because the food source that they're feeding on is not uh, extremely nutrient dense. And what they're trying to do during that time underground is store up a huge volume of of nutrients uh, that can power their change into an adult with these big wings that can fly around and do all of this mating. But while they're underground, they're doing some pretty hard work. The fluid that they're feeding on is under negative pressure. And that means that in order for them to actually get it out of the roots, they have to put some serious work into powering this pump on the front of their face that sucks the uh, the xylem fluid out of the roots such that they can feed. Uh, that requires muscular uh, muscular pressure and requires them to put in a, a good deal of energy. The cicadas that come out of the ground, they mate and they deposit their eggs, I guess, in the ground. But do they all die? Do any yeah. of them reburrow back into the soil? Or what's in the soil is eggs that are developing only? You know, it'd be really cool if the way that it worked was they emerge from underground, fly off into the trees, mate, and then go back underground and then do the whole thing over and over again. But the version of them that lives in the trees is not a version of them that can go back into the ground. They are structured for arboreal life when they get up into the treetops. Those big wings would be a liability underground. Their ability to dig, just it's greatly diminished by their their new anatomy and their new physiology. It's the ones that are underground that are designed for subterranean dwelling and are really good at what they do down there. Now, when they are above ground and they lay those eggs, that's the end of their lifespan. Uh, The males die soon after mating. The females die soon after they've laid uh, their, their clutch of eggs and they can lay hundreds of eggs. After they've laid these eggs, it's about 10 weeks after they've laid these eggs that the eggs will hatch in the branches of the tree. And these tiny little cicadas, about three millimeters long, will stream down from the trees into the ground. They'll dig their way down a little little more than a foot, and they will continue their life cycle feeding on a root, sometimes the root to the same tree that sustained their parents 17 years before. And the interesting thing is we are right about at that mark now where cicadas should be streaming down from the trees, which usually freaks people out. They're like, are they going to get my hair? Uh, what, what's going to happen as a result of all of this? Is it going to pretty much take over everything the way that it did when the cicadas first emerged? Well, probably not. Um, something that's three millimeters long is really easy to miss. They fall right out of those trees and no one really notices who isn't looking for them. Uh, There are a few circumstances where uh, the sort of a perfect storm of scenarios comes together where someone might actually see some of them. But for the most part, they are really small and virtually indistinguishable from a lot of the other bugs uh, by eye. And so a lot of people don't even notice. Oh, so the eggs are laid in the trees and then they either fall down or or they fly down? How do they get down from the trees? Oh, they just drop. 
Uh, when you are a really small organism like an insect, the effect of gravity, gravity is greatly diminished. And so falling out of a tree does nothing in the way of harm to these organisms. Ants are able to fall out of planes and just ride the wind all the way to the ground and be totally unharmed by the experience. So there is no parachute in this system. There are no wings on a cicada of that age. As they hatch from those branches in the trees, from the eggs in the branches in those trees, they just jump right out there and fall to the ground where they dig down and eventually restart that life cycle. Huh. So I would think that um, every, well, not every year, sorry, every 13 or 17 years, they come out in different spots because when they come out of the ground, they can fly around, but they look for trees. They may look for the one right nearest or further ones away. Then they hang out, they lay their eggs, and then the eggs kind of stay near those trees. So the ground kind of empties out and then goes into the trees, and then they come back from the trees into the ground. But do these populations tend to move? Is there like a center of mass of all these trillions of cicadas, again, that moves around with any regularity? The cicadas actually do move a fair bit. Now, it's not going to be huge, but each time the cicadas emerge, there are going to be some curious individuals within the population who are going to fly to a set of trees that have never seen cicadas before. And as they lay eggs in that tree, they're going to seed a new population in that area that can then emerge. And so you're going to have population front that's going to continue expanding more and more and more as these organisms build up in new areas. Now, the other thing that's fascinating about it, and honestly, a little sad, as we continue to develop, we pave over a lot of areas that the cicadas have staked their life on. Their life on. They are feeding on the roots of trees. And as they're feeding on these roots, if we decide to roll over an area and make it into a parking lot, that root is sealed under pavement. And those cicadas aren't able to to, to walk all the way to the edge of that pavement most of the time and, and find dirt that they can then burrow through. And they certainly can't burrow through the asphalt. So you end up sealing a bunch of these organisms underground where they unfortunately are not capable of emerging. So we are changing their environment and they are changing ours. And it's this interesting and very delicate dance back and forth. Interesting. Has anyone tried to, observe? I mean, I guess a good time to observe them is when they first start entering back into the soil then you wouldn't have to wait, you know, 13 years or whatever. But maybe even for a month, you can kind of profile their behavior and look at them and see what's going on. Yeah, you could definitely profile the behavior of these organisms. And there are people out there who are surveying where the cicadas are showing up. Gene Kritsky, who's a researcher famed for his work on cicadas, actually developed an app called the Cicada Safari app, where individuals can log on to this app and they can log where they are seeing the cicadas. Data from the Cicada Safari app has allowed us to see the expansion of the population front as these periodical cicadas emerge. And this is the first real brood 10 set of circumstances where we can measure something like this, because the last time uh, all of that happened. We didn't have citizen science connected to these really remarkable pieces of technology we have in our hands now, but smartphones have revolutionized how we can do citizen science. We can get so much more data and information from people when they can snap a picture of a cicada at the edge of an area where we didn't think that there were any periodical cicadas. And we can tell them, all right, well, now Brood 10 is in a state where we've never seen it before. Any difference between, you know, since cicadas have been tracked, you said there's like trillions of them. What's, what's different about the different emergences over the, you know, I don't know how long they've been tracked, hopefully over maybe at least three of these 17 year or 13 year cycles, but have any scientists looked at, okay, the last time this brood came, here's what happened. This time it's different. This time it's different, et cetera. Absolutely. And we've had researchers tracking this for, and I mean this, more than a century, uh, well over a century. And it's this kind of curiosity and interest about the world that I love and I was really glad to see this year. We have been in the middle of a pandemic. People have been more connected with nature, I think, than they are normally because that was a, a place in the world that was a refuge. Uh, you didn't have to worry as much about potentially being exposed to COVID if you were out in the woods hiking. And so it's allowed people to really connect to nature in that way. Uh, but we've been measuring cicada emergence for quite some time now, and we've been able to see some of the broods that have developed. Uh, so the, the cicadas emergence patterns 
are connected to broods. These are immature groups of cicadas that emerge as after a certain number of years. And so there are 13 year broods, there are 17 year broods. There are some cicadas that we know will emerge this year. There are some that we know will emerge four years from now, five years from now. Uh, and as these different broods are emerging, we can track how much larger they are from one year to the next. We can track which years they, uh, which, sorry, which states um, they've emerged in. And it's those sorts of things that allow us to better understand how these organisms grow, how they develop, and the impact that they have on the world around them. Well, I know we won't cover it in this interview, but uh, just as a teaser, you know, hopefully you can come back. What other uh, creatures are you studying that are really fascinating to you? I do a lot of work studying bees, and I mm. love them. Uh, bees are the most fascinating. So my my work has primarily focused on symbioses, close connections between organisms. And at the top of the show, uh, you explained that I've done a lot of work with predatory behavior and parasitoid behavior. It's because these close relationships between organisms, that's where the rubber hits the road. This is where the ecosystem dynamics really play out in ways that change the world around us. And so working with these bees, I've noticed that a huge, issue for their health happens to be parasites. Uh, we talk a lot mm. about the pesticides because that is a story that we've been able to wrap our heads around. We know that there were pesticides out there that were thinning uh, the eggshells of eagles and that as we have learned more about things like DDT, we've been able to better manage it and produce pesticides that are less damaging to the environment. So when we hear that the bees are dying, we want to to stick with the idea that there has to be uh, a chemical and just a chemical at the center of this whole problem. But it's not just pesticides. It's not just one thing. It happens to be an interlocking web of factors. And there are uh, parasitic mites that feed on the liver of these bees. Uh, my research has shown that it's, it's actually uh, the liver of the bees that they are able to liquefy and feed on. That's the same tissue that detoxifies the pesticides and other foreign chemicals that get into the bee's body uh, that we know there are certain levels of it that are sublethal to bees, but when they've been damaged by these parasites, even sublethal levels of it can cause their death. So I'm better understanding how these parasites interact with individuals in the colony and the entire colony structure and what we've learned is that they are not the only organisms out there that are causing these sorts of problems. There is a parasitic mite all the way off uh, in, well, it's expanding its geographic range, but it used to be present just in Southeast Asia. And that happens to be the area of the world where we originally got Varroa destructor, the parasite that I was just discussing. That was a parasitic mite from Southeast Asia. It's now an invasive species in the US and has been since uh, the 1980s. And now this parasite is moving around the world in much the same way that the Varroa mite was. And so we need to spend some time studying this organism because it seems to have a huge impact on the colony. Uh, it's a tiny creature, about half a millimeter in width, so pretty small, but it causes yep. substantial damage to the entire colony. And it's really helpful for us to better understand it. I'll actually be heading to Thailand to learn more about this organism uh, and to better understand how we can manage this creature before it ever reaches the U.S. That's really cool. Thanks so much. I had another idea with the, uh, well, I guess one more idea with the, the cicadas. If we're able to figure out how they, you know, how they, what cues they take on their timing of emergence, Imagine if we could grow them on farms and, you know, yeah. have them emerge whenever we feel like it. You have trillions of them and a lot of people could eat, you know, Precisely. A, lot of, a lot of creatures could eat them at least. A lot of creatures could eat them. A lot of people could eat them. It would be a much more sustainable means of us keeping our large populations of human beings that we have fed. At the end of the day, we can feed every person on this planet, but the issues come down to distribution and carbon emissions. And if we are going to... It, I think that we can create a more equitable system where these organisms can be grown in in mass and they can become a, a really healthy source of food that isn't contributing so substantially to our carbon footprint. But one, we'd have to get over the ick factor. A lot of people just find them icky and gross, the whole idea of eating insects. They don't classify them in the same category that the extender pinky sort of fancy seafood is in. Uh, they're these groups that live in the dirt and we can't eat those. So we have to get past that first. But then I think yeah. there's a whole world open to us. 
Well, very cool. Well, Sammy, what's the best way for people to find out more about your work? You can follow me on Twitter at Dr. Sammy Tweets, or you can follow me on Instagram at Dr. Sammy Grams. Those are great ways to stay in touch with the, the different projects that I'm conducting. You can see updates from those uh, on Instagram and you can stay in touch. You can really stay connected with uh, what work is being published and what I'm doing as well on Twitter. Okay. Well, very good. Well, Sammy, thank you for, so much for coming. It's been a really cool call. Yeah. Thanks so much. This has been great. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.